This video is made possible by Nebula. Use the link down in the description below to support real life lore directly by signing up, where you can watch dozens of additional and exclusive full length videos in my ongoing Nebula Modern Conflict series, covering recent major wars and crises, including this video's next part covering the entire history of the wars and fighting between Israel and Gaza from the 1980s to the current conflict today. On the 29th of September 2023, the United States National Security Advisor who reports directly to the President, Jake Sullivan, was speaking at the annual Atlantic Festival listing off all of the accomplishments that the Biden administration had achieved in the Middle East. After years of brutal warfare that had resulted in more than 300,000 deaths, a 19-month-long truce in civil war-torn Yemen was continuing to hold. The long-running civil war in Syria was beginning to stabilize and settle down as well, while Bashar al-Assad, the longtime Syrian dictator, was finally being welcomed back into the Arab League again after more than a decade-long suspension over his handling of the war in Syria that had claimed the lives of more than half a million people. Brokered by China, Saudi Arabia and Iran had finally agreed on restoring their relations in March of 2023, after having been severed six years previously. Brokered by America, Saudi Arabia and Israel were also on the cusp of normalizing their relations. Iran's attacks against American military bases had stopped, and there was a general sense in much of the world that the chronically violent and unstable Middle East was at last beginning to calm down and enter into a new era of peace. Jake Sullivan himself summed up the general foreign policy mood in the region during that speech on the 29th of September, when he said the following. And the Middle East region is quieter today than it has been in two decades. Now, challenges remain. Iran's nuclear weapons program, the tensions between Israelis and Palestinians. But the amount of time that I have to spend on crisis and conflict in the Middle East today compared to any of my predecessors going back to 9-11 is significantly reduced. It would only take two weeks for those words to immediately come back and haunt him. On the 7th of October, 2023, various Palestinian militant groups led by Hamas, the organization who rules in the Gaza Strip, launched a highly coordinated surprise land, sea, and air offensive against Israel. They managed to fire at least 5,000 rockets against Israel, while around 2,500 armed Hamas fighters managed to break through the walls surrounding Gaza and infiltrated into multiple villages of Israel itself, where they massacred at least 1,400 Israelis and other citizens in a single day wounded more than 5,000 others, and took around 200 more as hostages back into Gaza. The attack represented the single bloodiest day in the entire history of Israel, and the first time since 1948 that a hostile outside military power managed to break into Israel proper. It all came as a profound shock to the state of Israel, which has since responded with an unprecedented declaration of war against Hamas in Gaza that was followed up by the rapid mobilization of 300,000 Israeli reserve troops the largest and quickest call-up of reserves in Israel's entire history. The 16-year-long Israeli blockade of Gaza then subsequently transformed into a complete and total Israeli siege of Gaza, with the Israelis blocking off all electricity, fuel, telecommunications, water, and medicine from passing into Gaza through any of their territory by land, sea, or air. The Israeli Air Force began initiating a punishing aerial campaign across the Gaza Strip that saw more than 6,000 Israeli bombs dropped across the territory within only the first six days of the war beginning. More than double the amount of ordnance that the United States-led coalition dropped in an entire month in the war against ISIS. As the Israeli airstrikes continued on the 13th of October, Israel ordered that more than 1.1 million Palestinians immediately evacuate from the northern Gaza Strip towards the southern Gaza Strip within 24 hours or be potentially considered as enemy combatants. And then, two weeks later on the 27th of October, the Israeli ground forces launched their full-scale invasion into the northern Gaza Strip and, as of the production of this video, have Gaza City, the biggest city in Palestine with a pre-war population of more than 560,000 people, completely encircled. Once the Israeli ground forces push into Gaza City, they will likely experience what many military analysts believe will be nothing less than the most ferocious urban combat seen in history since the Second World War. While Israel's stated military objective going forward is to completely destroy Hamas as an institution and its estimated 40,000 fighters held up in the Gaza Strip. 
while securing the release of the more than 200 hostages that they continue to hold. And in pursuit of those war aims, the Gaza Health Ministry, run by Hamas, claims that, as of the production of this video, the Israeli airstrikes and ground invasion have already killed nearly 10,000 Palestinians within the Gaza Strip and wounded nearly 25,000 more. In addition to the estimated 1,000 or so Hamas fighters who were killed within Israel during the initial October 7th invasion. A truly catastrophic war has thus once again returned to the Middle East. And the longer that the war continues, the longer it risks spreading like a contagion to drag in multiple other powers into an even greater Middle East-wide war. The brief era of peace and stability in the Middle East has once again been shattered. And in order to understand why this is all suddenly happening right now, you only have to go back a few years ago to 2017 in order to understand how the countdown to war in October of 2023 began originally ticking. By the time the 2017 rolled around, the de facto geopolitical situation of the area was roughly the same as it had been for the past decade ever since 2007. How it got there in 2007 was a very, very complicated story. But to cover through it all very quickly, the British Empire acquired this territory in the eastern Mediterranean known as Mandatory Palestine after defeating the Ottoman Empire in World War I who had ruled the area for centuries beforehand. Most of the people who lived in the Mandate at that time were Arabs. But Jewish immigration to the land was increasing in scale as the Zionist movement in Europe sought to flee increasing anti-Semitism in places like Russia and later Germany by establishing an independent Jewish state in the land of their ancient ancestors. The British openly stated that they would support the creation of a Jewish state in Mandatory Palestine through the Balfour Declaration of 1917 though with vague and undetermined borders. As more Jews increasingly came to Mandatory Palestine, especially after the Nazis rose to power in Germany, the Arabs of the territory resented seeing more of their land getting taken over, and so they revolted in 1936. The British squashed that rebellion, but they attempted to placate the Arabs by restricting further Jewish immigration and land purchases within the Mandate. But this policy angered Jewish groups in the Mandate, and so Jewish militant groups formed who launched their own rebellion, and violence between themselves and the Arabs escalated even further. By 1947, the British decided to give up and withdraw from Mandatory Palestine altogether, and so they submitted the matter of what to do with it to the United Nations, who, in the wake of the Holocaust in Europe, faced growing international pressure for the creation of an independent Jewish state. They came up with the 1947 UN Partition Plan, which called for partitioning Mandatory Palestine into three separate states. An independent Jewish state, an independent Palestinian Arab state, and an internationally run city-state in Jerusalem. The Arab side, in particular, resented this proposal at the time, though. As they argued, it was too heavily biased towards the Jewish side, who were granted most of the Mandate's land, despite only representing about one-third of the Mandate's population at the time. The Jewish side, meanwhile, had misgivings about the plan as well, since most of the big cities and the actual arable land went to the Arab state, while Jerusalem itself was surrounded by Arab territory. But nonetheless, the Jewish side ultimately accepted the plan, while virtually the entire Arab world condemned the UN plan and rejected it and the violence between the Palestinian Arabs and the Jews in the Mandate only worsened. In 1948, Israel declared its independence from the Mandate based on the 1947 UN plan boundaries, but the Palestinians and a coalition of outside Arab states refused to recognize them and immediately invaded. Determined to overturn the UN partition plan that they saw as just another form of colonialism, seeking to steal more of their land. But Israel ended up winning that war and agreed on an armistice with the Arab states who attacked them in 1949. The so-called Green Line marked the military front line between the Israelis and the Arab states as it stood when that armistice agreement was signed. And though all of the Arab states at the time were very clear that the Green Line did not mark any final or agreed upon borders, it did mark the de facto border between themselves and Israel nonetheless. At the same time, the Gaza Strip fell under the control of Egypt, the West Bank fell under the control of Jordan, while Jerusalem itself became divided between Israeli control in the West and Jordanian control in the East. Israel's own expansion well beyond their originally accepted 1947 UN partition plan area also put them in control over large swaths of Palestinian Arab lands, which resulted in about 700,000 of them who either fled or were forcibly pushed out in an event that became known as the Nakba, or the Catastrophe, with many of them fleeing towards the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, and others towards Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. 
And so an independent Palestinian state was immediately extinguished. At the same time, in 1949, there were approximately one million Jews of Misrahi and Sephardi ancestry who lived all across the Muslim world as their ancestors had for thousands of years. But over the decades that followed as Israel established itself further, the vast majority of them were either forcibly expelled, fled, or voluntarily migrated away in a mass Jewish exodus away from the Muslim world and largely towards Israel. As a result, fewer than 30,000 Jews continue to live in the Muslim world today, down from around a million in 1948. Today, these Middle Eastern and North African Jews who left and their descendants comprise more than 50% of the Israeli Jewish population and represent the country's single largest ethnic group today, while another 32% of the Israeli Jewish population are of Ashkenazi ancestry from Eastern and Central Europe, who represent the second largest group. Ever since that time, both the Palestinians and the Israelis have struggled defining where one of their territories begins and the other ends, within the overall territory of the former British Mandate, and have struggled with achieving universal recognition by the outside world. Israel's mostly internationally recognized boundaries today consist of that so-called Green Line dating back to 1949. But there were also the additional territories that came under Israel's control during the later Six-Day War of 1967 that lay beyond the 1949 Armistice Green Line. Territories that are usually referred to as either the post-1967 territories or the Israeli-occupied territories. They include the Sinai Peninsula seized from Egypt, the Palestinian-inhabited territories that Israel seized from Egypt and Jordan, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights that were seized from Syria. After Israel seized all of these territories back in 1967, the United Nations Security Council passed Resolution 242, which effectively considered them all as occupied territories that the Israelis should immediately withdraw from, while the Arab League convened at Khartoum in Sudan, where they proclaimed the 1967 Khartoum Resolution, explicitly laying out their foreign policy towards Israel going forward. No peace with Israel, no recognition with Israel, and no negotiations with Israel. A policy that became known as the Arab world's three no's, and the foundation upon which no Arab state would recognize Israel's existence in any context or shape for decades. Over the decades that followed from 1967, Israel treated each of their post-1967 acquired territories very differently. Israel agreed to return the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt in 1979 in exchange for a formal peace treaty with Egypt and Egyptian recognition of Israel's right to exist, marking the first time that an Arab state would ever do such a thing and the first time that an Arab state would violate the three no's agreed upon by the Arab League back in the 1967 Khartoum Resolution. Israel then unilaterally decided to annex all of East Jerusalem in 1980, and subsequently proclaimed a unified Jerusalem as its own capital city, something that the United Nations would immediately declare as legally null and void under international law with Resolution 478, that considered East Jerusalem to still be an Israeli-occupied territory, and which also called upon all UN member states to withdraw their embassies from Jerusalem in the aftermath, which everybody eventually agreed to do. By the time 2017 rolled around, there wasn't a single other country in the world outside of Israel who recognized Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem or Jerusalem as the sole capital of Israel. Israel also decided to unilaterally annex the Golan Heights outright back in 1981, an action that the United Nations similarly declared under the passing of Resolution 497 immediately afterwards as null and void and without international legal effect. The Golan Heights would continue to be universally recognized by the entire international community as Israeli-occupied territory of Syria for decades, and this also continued to remain true by 2017. That left the West Bank and the Gaza Strip which Israel has also treated very differently from all of the other post-1967 territories. Egypt renounced its claim to the Gaza Strip in the peace treaty with Israel in 1978, while Jordan formally renounced its claims to the West Bank and East Jerusalem a decade later in 1988, before becoming the second Arab state to make peace with Israel and recognize Israel's existence in 1994. Those renunciations by Egypt and Jordan to the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, and Israel's continued internationally unrecognized occupation of all of them, left them each effectively as Palestinian-inhabited territories territories trapped in a state of permanent legal limbo for decades, as thousands of Israeli settlers began moving into all of them and displacing and angering the Palestinians who lived within them even further. After decades of violence between the Israeli authorities and the settlers on one side and the Palestinians on the other, in both the West Bank and East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, the Israelis and the Palestinians eventually agreed upon the Oslo Accords of 1993 and 1995, which established the Palestinian Authority as an interim Palestinian government body that was eventually assumed would, one day, take over full authority in the entire occupied West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip as the eventually fully independent state of Palestine. 
But in the interim until then, the Israeli and Palestinian sides agreed on what originally was supposed to only be a temporary division of the West Bank into three distinctly different areas with varying levels of control between the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli military and state. Area A would be the territories assigned entirely to the Civil and Security Administration run by the Palestinian Authority. Area B would be the territories assigned to only the civil administration run by the Palestinian Authority, but with a security administration that would continue to be run by the Israelis. And then there is also Area C, which would continue to be entirely run by both the Israeli civil and military authorities without any influence from the Palestinian Authority at all, which effectively placed Area C under the continued de facto control of Israel. Area C consists of approximately 61% of the West Bank's total territory, and is presently the home of all of Israel's settlements and settlers in the West Bank, wedged all in between the Palestinian Authority's Area A and Area B, and ringed all around Jerusalem, where more than 99% of all the land is either strictly off-limits or heavily restricted for Palestinians to access. Area C is also completely contiguous in area. While the Palestinian Authority's administer territories in areas A and B are not contiguous, and divided between 165 separate enclaves in between the contiguous Israeli-administered Area C that is chock full of Israeli settlements in a situation that has sometimes been referred to as the Palestinian Archipelago of the West Bank and a system that has been very frequently compared to the system of apartheid that white ruled South Africa and forced upon their black population until 1994. It was initially intended by the Oslo Accords of 1995 that all of Area C would be gradually transferred by the Israelis over to the Palestinian Authority's administration, but to date that has never ended up happening. Within one week of the Oslo II Accord being signed on the 28th of September 1995 that established the system of areas A and B in the West Bank and granted the Palestinian Authority limited control, the Israeli Prime Minister who signed them, Yitzhak Rabin, was assassinated by an Israeli right-wing extremist who was opposed to the concept of any independent Palestinian entity. And the next election that came the following year in 1996 brought Benjamin Netanyahu into the office of Israel's Prime Minister for the first time, which resulted in a stalling of any further negotiations between the Palestinian Authority and Israel. The supposedly temporary divisions within the West Bank agreed upon in 1995 immediately before Yitzhak Rabin's assassination have remained indefinite ever since, and the pace of Israeli settlers moving into Area C has only continued. At the current date in 2023, it's estimated that around 230,000 Israeli settlers live in the post-1967 territory of East Jerusalem, while another 470,000 Israeli settlers live within Area C of the West Bank across at least 132 separate settlements and more than 140 separate outposts, where they have full civil and political rights like every other Israeli citizen does, and representing a four-fold increase in Israeli settlers in the West Bank since the Oslo Accords were initially signed in 1995. This is in comparison to around 300,000 Palestinians who also live within Area C and are subject to Israeli military rule. Another roughly 2.8 million Palestinians who live confined within the Palestinian archipelago of areas A and B under the Palestinian Authority's administration in the West Bank, and another 362,000 Palestinians who live within the Israeli annexed East Jerusalem, all of whom have almost zero say over how they are actually governed. Israel's continued control over Area C in the West Bank for decades and hundreds of thousands of settlers that they have allowed to move into the territory since the 1990s have been frequently labeled as a violation of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which plainly states that, quote, the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population into the territory that it occupies, in this case being the West Bank. Meanwhile, by 2005, Israel maintained about 8,000 settlers across 21 different settlements in the Gaza Strip, but by then, the situation was becoming untenable. At only about twice the size of Washington, D.C., the Gaza Strip was geographically much smaller than the West Bank was, but with a population of 1.4 million Palestinians back then, it was also substantially more densely populated and urbanized than the West Bank was as well. The high costs associated with defending only a few thousand settlers in this crowded urbanized territory was becoming too costly for Israel to bear. And so, in 2005, they decided to unilaterally withdraw from the Gaza Strip altogether. All of the 21 Israeli settlements inside of it were destroyed, all 8,000 Israeli settlers within Gaza were either evacuated or forcibly withdrawn, while the military withdrew as well and for the first time, the entirety of the Gaza Strip's land territory was passed over to the Palestinian Authority, 
Although, Israel continued maintaining control over virtually all of Gaza's land crossings, with a fence they constructed around the entire territory back in 1994, along with continued control over all of Gaza's airspace that included Israel's destruction of the only airport in the Gaza Strip back in 2002. And then, finally, came the Palestinian legislative elections of January 2006 shortly afterwards, in which the political party known as Hamas achieved an unexpectedly decisive victory. Before then, the Palestinian Authority had been always controlled and dominated by the secular, socialist, and Palestinian Arab nationalist party known as Fatah, who had initially seeked Israel's total destruction and the establishment of a secular, Palestinian Arab socialist state over the entirety of the former British Mandate area in its place, but had subsequently made peace with Israel during the Oslo Accords and then restricted their ambitions to establishing an independent Palestinian state limited only to the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip instead. By contrast, Hamas was a Sunni Islamist and Palestinian Nationalist Party, who argued that Fatah had become too complacent and too cooperative with Israel, and had abandoned the true original Palestinian cause. Hamas continued to be fully committed to Israel's total destruction, the same way that Fatah had used to be prior to the Oslo Accords. And separately from Fatah, Hamas advocated for the eventual establishment of a Sunni Islamist Palestinian state across the entirety of the former British Mandate area, once Israel had been completely destroyed. After a brief civil war within the Palestinian Authority between Hamas and Fatah, Hamas emerged victorious within the Gaza Strip and pushed Fatah out completely by the middle of 2007, which has ever since led to a continuous division within the Palestinian leadership. The Sunni Islamists of Hamas based in the Gaza Strip, who are fully dedicated to Israel's total destruction and the eventual establishment of a Sunni Islamic state across the entirety of the former British Mandate in its place, and the secular, socialist, and nationalist Fatah based in the Palestinian archipelago of the the West Bank, willing to work together with Israel to eventually establish an independent Palestinian state based on the entirety of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, while recognizing Israel's own borders based on the 1949 Armistice Green Line, the same way that Egypt and Jordan do. But Israel responded to Hamas's uncompromising takeover of the Gaza Strip in 2007 by initiating a complete land, air, and sea blockade over the territory that harshly limited the ability of Palestinians or goods to exit or enter, a blockade that Gaza's other neighbor Egypt agreed to fully participate in on their side of the border as well. The 1994 era fence surrounding Gaza by land across Israel and Egypt was then extensively upgraded into the modern system of high walls, barbed wire, motion sensors, and even robotic machine guns while the Israeli Navy enforced a maritime no-go zone around the Gaza Strip by sea, while the Israeli Air Force enforced a no-fly zone over the Gaza Strip's airspace. Israel's stated aims of enforcing the blockade over the Gaza Strip were to restrict the ability of the Hamas-led government inside from being able to import weapons from abroad to use against Israel, and to economically strangle the Hamas-led government and apply pressures on it to either moderate its position or face a slow, grinding collapse with a permanent scarcity of resources and supplies, generating unrest amongst the Palestinians they were elected to govern. But for the past 16 years that have followed this blockade of Gaza beginning, Hamas has neither moderated its position nor collapsed from power, while frequent fighting has consistently erupted between them and Israel ever since. And so, the joint Israeli-Egyptian blockade has continued on without a pause now for the past 16 years that have followed ever since 2007, a situation that has been frequently labeled as one of the 21st century's vastest humanitarian catastrophes. Israel's 16-year ongoing blockade of Gaza has been frequently labeled by human rights advocates as a form of collective punishment applied to everyone who lives within the Gaza Strip, while Israel has always counter-maintained that the policy is necessary to protect their own citizens from attacks coming from Hamas. Notably, Gaza's population has increased from around 1.4 million people when the blockade began in 2007 to about 2.2 million people today in 2023 meaning that about 800,000 of the Palestinians within the Gaza Strip, or about 40% of the entire population right now, are currently children 16 years or younger who have been born during this total blockade and who have literally never known anything other than life confined within the walls, enforced by the Israeli military, and stuck under Hamas's continued uncompromising leadership. And all of the accompanying poverty, hunger, resource scarcity, and occasional ferocious violence that has come with it. At only about twice the size of Washington, D.C., the Gaza Strip has since become one of the most crowded and densely populated places anywhere in the entire world. And surrounded by high walls and a naval blockade on all sides, and an enforced no-fly zone above it, where hardly anyone is ever allowed to leave, for any reason at all. 
It has also frequently been referred to ever since as constituting nothing less than the world's largest open-air prison, wherein the highest ambitions for any of the millions of people within the prison to have aspired towards for the past 16 years have been limited only to either escaping from it or becoming the prison's new warden. This was the extremely complicated geopolitical state that Israel and Palestine both found themselves in between 2007 and 2017, with Israel effectively managing its post-1967 acquired and occupied territories with a suffocating blockade enforced around the Gaza Strip, increasing the numbers of its settlers in Area C of the West Bank, accompanied by frequent talks of annexing parts or all of it directly, and prior outright annexations of East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights that nobody else in the outside world recognized as being legitimate. At the same time, Israel was maintaining international recognition based on its 1949 Green Line armistice borders with most of the world's other countries, though with very notable exceptions continuing in the Arab and Muslim worlds who had largely never recognized Israel's existence ever since the end of the British Mandate in 1948 along with several anti-colonial or anti-Western socialist states like North Korea, Cuba, and Venezuela. By 2017, the only Arab states that had ever recognized Israel's existence and made peace were Egypt in 1980 and Jordan in 1994, with all the others continuing to hold ranks in solidarity with the Palestinians and the three no's of the 1967 Khartoum Resolution. The state of Palestine, meanwhile, based on its claims to the entire West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip from the Oslo Accords in 1993 and 1995, and represented by the Fatah-led Palestinian Authority, was recognized by most of the outside world as well and was granted the status of a permanent observer at the United Nations in 2012 though very notably lacked any official recognition across most of the Western world, including none from Israel, the United States, Canada, Australia, Japan, and most of Western Europe. And despite its continued de jure claims to sovereignty in the entire West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, the Palestinian Authority really only maintained de facto authority over the Palestinian archipelago within the West Bank, with the rest of the West Bank and Area C under continued Israeli colonial and military rule. East Jerusalem being annexed directly into Israel itself, and the Gaza Strip under the control of its rival Hamas government, completely blockaded by the Israelis and Egyptians, with frequent violence erupting all around it. This was the general situation that remained more or less the same between 2007 and 2017 until things finally started rapidly changing even further in favor of the Israelis after Donald Trump assumed the American presidency in January of 2017. Within his first year of assuming office in December of 2017, the Trump administration extended official U.S. recognition of Jerusalem as the capital city of Israel, which effectively extended formal U.S. recognition to Israel's unilateral annexation of East Jerusalem as well, an action that had previously gone unrecognized by the entire international community since 1980. The day after the U.S. announcement was made, the U.N. Security Council called for an emergency meeting where 14 out of the 15 members universally condemned the American decision. But it was vetoed and overturned by the sole remaining member of the council, the United States itself. The vast majority of the world's leaders sharply condemned the American decision because it effectively meant that the United States would never recognize East Jerusalem as being a part of any future independent Palestinian state. To date, only a handful of other countries have followed the Americans' lead in recognizing a unified Jerusalem as being exclusively Israel's capital, Guatemala and Honduras, and the only partially recognized state of Kosovo being the only other ones. Hamas, still blockaded within the Gaza Strip, immediately seized on the opportunity to demand a new Palestinian intifada or uprising be launched against the Israelis in response to the American decision. On the 14th of May, 2018, the United States officially transferred its embassy to Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, with the new embassy's grand opening, which sparked mass protests organized by Hamas within the Gaza Strip near to the Israeli border wall that went on for every single Friday for nearly an entire year and a half until the end of 2019 that tens of thousands of Palestinians participated in, and which the Israeli Defense Forces responded to harshly with frequent tear gas and sniper fire that resulted in the deaths of at least 223 Palestinians and more than 9,200 injuries. And in the same month that America recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, the Netanyahu administration's ruling Likud party in Israel passed a resolution that instructed Israeli legislators to finally begin pursuing the full unilateral annexation of the West Bank next, an action that Israel had long resisted formally doing ever since 1967, largely out of the fear of what the international backlash towards them would end up being. 
then after becoming the first outside country to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel in 2017. The United States under the Trump administration chose to officially recognize the 1981-era Israeli annexation of the Golan Heights next in March of 2019, making the United States the first and so far only other country besides Israel itself to recognize the Golan Heights as fully sovereign Israeli territory rather than a Syrian territory under the occupation of Israel. These American recognitions of Israel's sovereignty over East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights were each continued forward with the Biden administration after 2021 as well, and it has since become a policy that is widely viewed by countries all around the world as an act of enormous hypocrisy on the part of Washington. As America has recognized Israel's unilateral annexations of territories that the entire rest of the world considers to be occupied and which America itself considered to be occupied for decades, while America simultaneously has fiercely rejected Russia's unilateral annexations of territories in Ukraine that are also considered to be occupied, like Crimea, Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, and Luhansk. It has since made it appear to many outside observers that America isn't actually serious about upholding the norms of international law, but is only interested in selectively applying it to its rivals like Russia when they occupy and annex territories, while ignoring it for their friends and allies like Israel when they occupy and annex territories. Then it was in the following year, during a White House press conference on the 28th of January 2020, when the Trump administration, alongside the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, revealed what they each referred to as the deal of the century, better known as the Trump Peace Plan. The Trump administration's political proposal to finally resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict once and for all. The plan envisaged an independent Palestinian state composed only of various separated enclaves within the West Bank that would continue to be divided and completely surrounded by significantly expanded Israeli territory well beyond the mostly internationally recognized 1949 Armistice Green Line. The plan also completely rejected a Palestinian capital based in East Jerusalem proper, which the Trump administration had effectively recognized as fully Israeli territory back in 2017. Instead, the plan proposed that a new Palestinian capital would be exiled to the outskirts of Jerusalem and be separated from Jerusalem proper and all of Jerusalem's holy sites by the Israeli-constructed West Bank Wall that now fully encloses the city from the rest of the West Bank. The plan even further demanded that these limited concessions allotted to a future independent Palestinian state would only be accepted by Israel and the United States if the Palestinian side first agreed to a status of total demilitarization and disarmament and agreed to completely abandon all international legal action against Israel and the United States as well. And then, even further, during the press conference that was announcing the plan in the White House, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, declared that the Israeli government would be immediately annexing the entire Jordan Valley and all of the Israeli settlements within the West Bank. This would have effectively resulted in an Israeli annexation of 30% of the West Bank's territory, and the third formal unilateral annexation of the Israelis in the post-1967 territories that virtually the entire world beyond the United States and Israel consider to be occupied territories. The 2020 Trump peace plan was ultimately resoundingly rejected by virtually all Palestinians and even many Israelis alike along with most of the rest of the world. Joe Biden and every other leading Democratic 2020 presidential candidate labeled the plan as a smokescreen for the Israeli annexation of the occupied West Bank. The UN rejected the plan and reaffirmed its own commitment to a two-state solution within the former mandatory Palestine based on Israel's pre-1967 Green Line borders and a Palestinian state in the entire West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip. Mahmoud Abbas, the longtime undemocratic leader of the Fatah party and the Palestinian Authority, since he won his only election in 2005, showed a map of the Trump peace plan at the United Nations Security Council that he famously described as turning Palestine into Swiss cheese. And naturally, both his own government in the Palestinian archipelago of the West Bank and his rival Hamas government in the Gaza Strip rejected the plan as being too heavily biased towards the Israeli side. Moreover, even the Israelis' Yesha Council, an umbrella organization organization representing the hundreds of thousands of Israeli Jewish settlers in the West Bank rejected the Trump peace plan as well on the simple basis that it granted the Palestinians an independent state at all, which they were completely opposed to even in this extremely limited context. 
But as it became clear that the 2020 Trump plan defining an enlarged Israeli state and a shrunken Palestinian state would never be implemented over the vast disagreements on all sides involved, the Trump administration began making significant advances for Israel on the diplomatic front anyway. Behind the scenes, the Trump administration had been mediating negotiations between Israel and the United Arab Emirates that suddenly resulted in a shocking joint statement between them on the 13th of August, 2020. Israel agreed that they would indefinitely suspend all of their plans for annexing parts of the West Bank like the Jordan Valley and their settlements in Area C, while in exchange, the United Arab Emirates agreed to fully normalize their relations with Israel, with the first ever direct commercial flights launching between them by the end of the month. It was a shocking announcement, because it represented only the third time in history since the British Mandate of Palestine expired in 1948 that an Arab state had ever recognized Israel, after Egypt had done so back in 1980 and after Jordan had done so in 1994. From 1994 onwards, for the next quarter of a century, none of the rest of the Arabs would officially break rank and make peace with Israel, sticking on paper to the 1967 Three Nose Agreement that they had all agreed upon back in Khartoum all that long long time ago. But now, all of a sudden in the summer of 2020, seemingly out of nowhere, the United Arab Emirates had become the third Arab state overall and the first Persian Gulf state to openly violate the 1967 Khartoum Resolution and make peace with Israel without the final status of the Palestinians being resolved first. And it would be far from the last to do so. In a series of subsequent negotiations that came to be known overall as the Abraham Accords, the Trump administration was able to almost immediately convince Bahrain after the United Arab Emirates to become the fourth Arab state to fully normalize their relations with Israel in September of 2020. Then, just three months after that, in December of 2020, during the closing days of the Trump administration, the United States was able to convince Morocco to become the fifth Arab state to fully normalize their relations with Israel as well. That one was accomplished by Washington offering that, in exchange for Morocco recognizing Israel, the United States would extend its formal recognition to Morocco's unilateral annexation of the disputed territory of Western Sahara, a territory that Morocco had previously unilaterally declared to completely annex as their so-called southern province provinces all the way back in the late 1970s, but which remained unrecognized by anyone else in the outside world for decades afterwards, with the United Nations having always considered the Moroccan annexation, like all other unilateral annexations that have come following World War II, to be legally null and void. So, in exchange for Morocco's recognition of Israel then, the United States became the first country in the world to ever recognize Morocco's unilateral annexation of Western Sahara, just as it had become the first country to ever recognize Israel's unilateral annexation of the Golan Heights and East Jerusalem in the couple years beforehand, all of which would ultimately provide even more hefty diplomatic ammunition to countries like Russia to blast the United States with later on, over Washington's hypocrisy regarding its selective applications of international law approving unilateral annexations of UN-recognized occupied territories whenever Israel and now also Morocco do it, but fiercely rejecting it whenever Russia does the same thing in Ukraine. Three years later, in 2023, Israel would return the favor granted by Morocco by becoming the second state in the outside world to formally recognize Morocco's annexation of Western Sahara as well. And then, on January 6, 2021, on the very same day that a mob of pro-Trump supporters stormed the American Capitol building in Washington, D.C., another event of monumental geopolitical importance was simultaneously taking place over on the other side of the world, within the symbolic capital city of Sudan, Khartoum, the very location from which the Arab League had previously proclaimed its three-nose policy towards Israel more than 53 years previously. That day on January 6th in that precise symbolic location, the Sudanese government became the next Arab government to formally sign on to the Abraham Accords as well, which initiated the process of full Sudanese normalization with Israel as well. In order to convince them, the Trump administration had agreed to remove Sudan from America's state sponsor of terrorism list and provided them with a $1.2 billion loan to help clear Sudan's government debt to the World Bank. And just like that, the Trump administration was able to increase the pace of Israel's recognition in the Arab world from only two across 72 years of history to four more in fewer than five months, bringing the total up to six of them by 2021. And all without the underlying issue of Palestinian statehood being resolved first, that had long prevented Israel's recognition by any of the Arabs. By the time the Biden administration assumed office in Washington, it was seeming as if Israel was indeed going to be able to both eat their cake and still have it too. 
The Palestinians themselves were fully contained, divided or scattered with an uncompromising Hamas-led government still dedicated to Israel's total destruction blockaded in Gaza. A mostly cooperative and collaborating Fatah-led government, isolated and divided across areas A and B of the West Bank, several million more completely removed Palestinian refugees scattered across Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, and about 1.6 million Palestinian citizens of Israel itself, who comprised a minority of only about 20% of Israel's citizen population. Despite Palestinians' total population across all of the former mandatory Palestine area, today remaining a slight majority at about 51% of the overall population, compared to the Jews at about 47%. To say nothing of the several million additional Palestinian refugees beyond the former mandatory Palestine in Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Lebanon, who have consistently argued for a right of return to the area of the former British Mandate that they or their ancestors fled or were forced out from. A right that represents a major component of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations that has always been refused by the Israeli side. From the Palestinian perspective, if more and more outside Arab states continue normalizing their ties with Israel, despite the Palestinians' dire situation on statehood, it could eventually have reached a tipping point where the Israeli government would eventually feel secure enough, in a region with fewer overtly hostile enemies, to finally begin the process of formally annexing territories in the West Bank like the Jordan Valley and their numerous settlements, if not the entire West Bank altogether. Something that has long been a goal of numerous right-wing and far-right Israeli parties for decades, but which has so far always been resisted out of fears of what the international response towards them would end up being. But if the fear of a harsh international response was removed, then what other deterrent would there have ever been? For the incoming Biden administration in 2021, the next goal for continuing on the Abraham Accords even further and achieving the biggest prize of all would be convincing the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to become the next Arab country to normalize its relations with Israel as well. By this point in time, to most of the monarchist Gulf Arab states, Israel was already naturally starting to be viewed as less of an outright hostile enemy and more of a potential ally that they could maybe cooperate and do business with. The theocratic Islamic Republic in Iran ruled by the Ayatollahs and their ideology of radical Shiite Islamic revolution had long espoused a foreign policy that advocated for the eventual unification of the entire Muslim world beneath the authority of their own Shia-dominated clergy, which included three initial objectives to accomplish first in very specific orders of importance. Number one, destroy and remove all American and Western influence in the Islamic world that was perceived as a lasting vestige of the age of colonialism and corruptive. Number two, completely destroy the state of Israel that is similarly viewed by Iran's regime as a foreign Western colonial power occupying lands that are historically and rightfully Islamic. And number three, spread the Islamic revolution and the authority of Iran's Shiite clergy to the rest of the Muslim world, which necessitates overthrowing and toppling all of the various monarchies that exist across the Muslim world that Iran's clergy deem to be heretical and contradictory to where authority within Islamic states should truly lie with the clergy and not with the nobility. Thus, ever since the Islamic Revolution of 1979, Iran has been consistently opposed to Israel's entire existence and to the existence of the Sunni Muslim monarchist regimes reigning in Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Jordan. Just before 2020, when the Abraham Accords began rapidly accelerating Israel's recognition across the Arab world, the Iranians were making significant geopolitical gains against the Arab monarchy specifically. They had successfully backed the Shia-adjacent Houthi movement in Yemen and kept them in power over most of the western side of the country, immediately opposite from Saudi Arabia's Shia majority and unstable southern border, and directly across from the strategic Bab al Mandeb Strait, through which a large amount of Saudi Arabia's oil exports flow through. Despite the Saudis spending nearly $265 billion in a years-long military intervention to crush the Houthis that failed, Iran's Shia militia organizations were growing increasingly powerful and influential in Iraq after the destruction of ISIS. Bashar al-Assad's government was winning the civil war in Syria against the Saudi-supported side. Hezbollah was growing even more powerful and more heavily armed than the Lebanese government itself. While the Gaza Strip, ruled by Hamas, remained a thorn in the side of both Israel and the anti-Islamist regime in Egypt of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. These pieces, carefully positioned by the Iranians over decades across the board of the Middle East, represents what Tehran likes to call its axis of resistance, and Saudi Arabia was beginning to feel like the axis was encircling them. 
And then in 2019, Iran itself, or its proxies, even fired cruise missiles at Saudi Arabia that blew up the kingdom's biggest oil processing facilities at Abqaiq in Koreas, that temporarily knocked half of the country's oil production offline, an attack that the kingdom's historic defender, the United States, refused to retaliate over. The Saudi monarchy quickly calculated after those attacks and after their military quagmire in Yemen that in order for them to have the best shot at surviving the coming inevitable confrontations with Iran over the rest of the century, they could no longer continue relying exclusively on their status as the world's biggest exporter and supplier of oil to keep the United States interested in defending them, a country that was becoming increasingly self-reliant on their own oil production through the shale and fracking revolutions. They needed to lock down an ironclad mutual defense treaty with the United States, just like the ones Washington has with their closest allies like NATO, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and the Philippines. Philippines that would legally bind the United States to come to the kingdom's defense if they were ever to be attacked by Iran or their proxies again. And to help lock that treaty down, they began to also recognize that the enemy of their enemy could also end up becoming their friend. And that friend was potentially Israel, a country they had long opposed on the basis of solidarity with the Palestinian Arabs, but a country that posed no serious existential threat to the monarchy in the Saudi kingdom, the same way that revolutionary Iran and its axis of resistance did. That's part of the context that contributed to the Sunni monarchies in the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain agreeing to both recognize Israel with the Trump administration's mediation in 2020. And it's been a heavy part of the calculus that has been going on with the Biden administration's attempts to mediate a further normalization agreement between the Saudis and the Israelis next. And thus, across 2022 and 2023, the Saudis, the Israelis, and the Americans were all negotiating and discussing this process to jointly solve all of their own unique problems of the 2020s. Going into the negotiations, the Saudis were deliberately, artificially cutting their own oil production lower and lower to the point where their spare oil production capacity reached 3 million barrels of oil per day by October of 2023. Meaning that, essentially, within a single month's notice, the Saudis could, hypothetically, decide to just flip a switch and unleash the spigots and dump an entire Brazil's worth of oil production onto the world market again which would, of course, dramatically reduce global oil prices, greatly taper global inflationary pressures and fuel prices leading into the upcoming American presidential election, while simultaneously harming Russia's ability to continue financing its war in Ukraine. As Russia, being the second largest oil exporter in the world, overwhelmingly relies on selling its own oil and gas reserves to fund their own government and military expenditures. And the lower global oil prices are, the less money Russia has to continue funding its war in Ukraine. The Biden administration, obviously, would greatly desire this outcome of the Saudis unleashing their taps. And to sweeten the deal even further, the Saudis would be willing to fully normalize their relations with Israel as well, granting the Biden administration a historic political achievement that the Trump administration before it wasn't quite capable of acquiring. All they were asking for in return was for Washington to solve all of their own problems. An ironclad mutual defense treaty permanently committing the United States to the kingdom's future defense against Iran, and American nuclear energy technology to enable the Saudis to establish a nuclear energy industry that would include the ability to enrich their own uranium that, in a pinch, could enable the Saudis to rapidly develop their own nuclear weapon in the event that the Iranians suddenly developed one first. To the Biden administration in the United States, a deal enabling greater cooperation between the Israelis and the Gulf Arab monarchies was also highly desirable for multiple reasons. It was well known by this point that America was attempting to finally withdraw most of its military forces from the Middle East in order to focus on countering what Washington views as the far more pressing geopolitical challenges of the decade. Russian military aggression and expansion in Europe, aimed at Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and likely elsewhere in the former Soviet world, and Chinese desires to fully and finally dominate Taiwan and East Asia. The Biden administration's commitment to finally withdraw from America's military presence in the region to focus more aggressively on these other theaters was most infamously symbolized by the disastrous American withdrawal from Afghanistan in the summer of 2021 and the ensuing Taliban blitzkrieg that immediately catapulted the Taliban right back into power again that undo nearly all of America's trillions of dollars, thousands of lives, and decades of efforts spent trying to dislodge them. 
Washington knows that Iran and its axis of resistance remains its most potent geopolitical threat in the Middle East, who is the most capable force of throwing the entire world economy into chaos by launching wars in the Persian Gulf and all around the world's most critical oil and gas trade routes, the consequences of which would be spiking global oil and gas prices that would most immediately benefit the Russian war machine that is still raging across Ukraine. This is why the United States now more than ever needs its local allies in the Middle East who have historically not cooperated well together because of the Palestinian issue remaining unresolved to set aside their differences and finally begin cooperating to contain Iran and its axis of resistance, while Washington's own forces relocate to focus on containing China in the Pacific and Russia in Eastern Europe. This is why the United States wants Israel and Saudi Arabia, its two biggest partners in the Middle East and the two greatest Middle Eastern military powers beyond Iran and Turkey, who have never had any formal relations before, to finally begin working together along with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain against all of their mutual enemies in the region, Iran's axis of resistance. And then to Israel, Saudi Arabia of all countries extending their recognition to the Jewish state would be a permanent game changer. Saudi Arabia is the leading oil exporter of the world, and with that comes enormous economic power. Dominated by its world-leading oil exports, Saudi Arabia wields what is by far the largest economy in the Arab world, that is more than two and a half times larger than the Egyptian economy, despite having only a third of Egypt's population. The Saudi economy is indeed so outsized compared to the rest of the Arab world that it represents nearly one-third of the entire Arab League's combined economy all on its own. Saudi Arabia is thus most often thought of as the premier leading Arab state today, despite having only the sixth largest overall population in the Arab world. And it's not just because of Saudi Arabia's outsized economic power either, but for their religious legitimacy within the worldwide Islamic faith, owing to their control and stewardship over the two holiest cities and sites in Islam. Mecca and Medina. If the Saudis recognized Israel's legitimacy then, there's no telling how much further their heavy weight would have carried with influencing even more Arab and Muslim countries around the world to recognize Israel next, especially in the context of Sudan, Morocco, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates, all recognizing Israel immediately beforehand too. But the Saudi monarchy knew that simply recognizing Israel without addressing the underlying question of Palestinian statehood at all would have been a deeply unpopular move among their own people, who continue to overwhelmingly value their solidarity with their fellow Palestinian Arabs more than the cold geopolitical calculus that the ruling family prioritizes for the sake of their own survival. And so, Riyadh was also demanding some limited and relatively small concessions from the Israelis relating to the ongoing Israeli occupation of the West Bank, in order to save some face and appear to continue being the Arab world's champion. But this was proving difficult for specifically the new Israeli government of 2023 to accept, because it was a brand new coalition government, largely composed of hardcore right-wing Israeli nationalist parties who wanted to completely annex the entire West Bank outright. The preceding November 2022 legislative elections in Israel had resulted in what has been called the most far-right government in Israel's entire history, a byproduct of years worth of higher fertility rates among Israel's most religious sects of Judaism, resulting in a shifting of demographics further towards the religious right that is expected to continue for decades to come. Leading into the negotiations on normalization with Saudi Arabia, Benjamin Netanyahu was already considered to have been fighting within Israel for his continued political survival. His new coalition government in 2023 consists of pro-settler parties like Jewish Power and the Religious Zionist Party that favor deporting Palestinians considered to be disloyal from Israel and favor further Israeli annexations in the West Bank. The coalition agreement between Netanyahu's own Likud Party and the Religious Zionist Party that followed those elections in November of 2022 specifically stated, quote, The Prime Minister will work towards the formulation and promotion of a policy whereby sovereignty is applied to the Judea and Samaria, Judea and Samaria being the Israeli right-wing term for the West Bank. As a result, in February of 2023, the Israeli Defense Ministry agreed to transfer most of their administrative powers in the West Bank over to a West Bank settler named Bezalel Smotrich, the leader of the Religious Zionist Party and the brand new coalition government's appointed Minister of Finance, a move that effectively appointed Smotrich, an avowed Jewish supremacist who openly opposes any Palestinian statehood at all and denies the existence 
of the Palestinian people as the de facto governor of the West Bank. And while the move might not have been accompanied by the same kind of pomp and circumstance that went along with Russia's declared unilateral annexations of occupied territories in Ukraine, this Israeli transfer of authority in the West Bank from military rule to civilian rule effectively amounted to a quiet de jure Israeli annexation of the West Bank anyway, and further cemented Israel's long-term designs on incorporating the territory even further at the expense of the Palestinians, and in contravention to the agreed-upon Oslo Accords of 1993 and 1995. And thus, for Netanyahu to compromise on any plans of further incorporating the West Bank into Israel would mean betraying his own coalition partners who were keeping him in power, which significantly tied his hands on the negotiations with Saudi Arabia, who was wanting to see at least some symbolic progress against the occupation of the West Bank being made. But progress was still being made nonetheless, with the Saudi crown prince himself saying in September of 2023, mere weeks before Hamas's attack on Israel, that every day the prospects of normalized relations between the kingdom and Israel were getting closer. All of this build-up to war began coming to a head in 2023, when Iran and the Saudis first negotiated a full restoration in their own diplomatic relations in March, with the mediation of the Chinese. A clear attempt by Iran to present itself and its axis as being less threatening to Riyadh in order to dissuade the Saudis from seeing the need to ally any further with Israel. Clearly, Iran does not want its two biggest self-declared enemies in the region, Israel and the Saudi monarchy, actually cooperating together against them. Iran would prefer to divide and conquer, and prevent Israel and the Saudis from being able to cooperate against them. Divided, they are easier targets for Tehran and their access to work against independently, one at a time, whenever they believe the times are right. Any deal between Tel Aviv and Riyadh that would disrupt that capability would have thus been anathema and unacceptable to Tehran's regime. Ultimately, as of the production of this video, it's still not precisely clear if Iran ended up having any direct influence or not on Hamas's attack on Israel that was launched on October 7th. But Hamas and Iran do have a very long relationship. Iran somewhat supports Hamas's regime in the Gaza Strip because they share at least one core aligned goal the total destruction of Israel as a state. But Hamas is not just a total proxy of Iran that answers directly to the Ayatollah in the same kind of way that Hezbollah in Lebanon does. Hamas and Iran have core ideological and theological differences that matter. Hamas is a militant Sunni Islamist and Palestinian Arab nationalist organization, while Iran envisions the ultimate establishment of a pan-Islamist state ruled by their own Shiite clergy that would, assumingly one day, include all of Palestine as well. Of course, differences in ideology haven't stopped Iran from cooperating with other regimes in its axis of resistance before, such as the Arab nationalist and nominally secular Assad regime in Syria, but the differences between Hamas and Iran are still notable nonetheless. Hamas has historically cooperated with Iran and the rest of the axis of resistance in a sort of marriage of convenience. Not because they do so enthusiastically, but because there's basically nobody else in the world who will actually directly support them against Israel. As Hamas is recognized as a terrorist organization by basically the entire Western world in Egypt, Hamas knows that Iran views them as essentially a pawn on their board of the Middle East. A pawn that can be sacrificed to achieve strategic outcomes. Like, finally, crashing the Israel-Saudi normalization process once and for all. But Hamas has been left with no other choice but to operate as Iran's pawn. And, even independently of Iran's reasons and influence, Hamas had their own motives to launch their attack on October 7th as well. By provoking Israel into launching a massive retaliatory invasion of the Gaza Strip, it puts Saudi Arabia into a very uncomfortable position. Would they, as the self-professed leader of the Arab world and advocate for the Arab people, continue normalizing relations with Israel in the midst of cataclysmic suffering of the Palestinian Arabs in Gaza? Continuing to do so would have fundamentally undermined the Saudi monarchy's own legitimacy with its people, and with Arabs and Muslims the world over. And so potentially with them deciding to stop the deal, the Saudis and Israelis wouldn't end up being able to cooperate together against one of Hamas's biggest supporters, Iran. 
The pace of continued recognition of Israel in the Arab world from the Abraham Accords may finally be stopped. The unresolved question of Palestinian statehood may finally return back to the forefront of political discourse in the Arab and outside worlds. International pressure on Israel may continue to grow, and perhaps the Israeli government would feel less secure in their looming plans to annex the West Bank, and potentially even feel less secure in continuing on with their 16-year-long blockade of the Gaza Strip. So far, it appears that many of these objectives have begun to already be achieved. Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, has already announced that the talks of normalizing relations with Israel will be put indefinitely on hold until the war in Gaza is over. And he has begun increasing his demands of Israel for a deal much further than he was before. Now, the Saudis are demanding that in order for the normalization agreement to be made after the war is concluded, Israel must fully withdraw all of its hundreds of thousands of settlers from the West Bank entirely. Something that the hundreds of thousands of Israeli settlers themselves and the increasingly far-right Israeli demographics and parties who currently govern the country will most likely never be willing to accept. And that means that it's highly doubtful that Israel and the Saudis will be able to actually work out a deal and fully cooperate together against Iran going forward forward. Moreover, Washington's strategic plans for a new security arrangement in the Middle East to cover for their reshuffling of forces to focus on countering China and Russia now appear to have failed. With the future cooperation between the Israelis and the Saudis against the Iranians and the axis of resistance now appearing to be in tatters, Iran will continue to be emboldened to whittle away at the Israelis and Saudis one at a time and at a time and place of their own choosing while Iran's increasingly close ally Russia will be strengthened by the deal falling apart as well. Because now the Saudis have very little incentive to turn back online their spare oil production capacity of 3 million barrels of oil a day, which will likely keep oil prices higher for longer, and which will keep allowing the Russians to continue earning more money on their oil exports to keep pushing back against American influence in Ukraine and Europe. Moreover, America now might not be able to afford to turn its full attention away from the Middle East, like they had previously hoped to do, meaning that America's own forces will have to pick and choose their battles of support between a rotating cast of Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, as the increasingly close partnership of Iran, Russia, and China choose when to strike against global American hegemony next. As the Israeli ground forces are now invading the Gaza Strip and are dedicated to Hamas's complete destruction, it becomes apparent that sometimes you have to be willing to sacrifice a pawn in order to bait your enemy into making a strategic mistake. And it seems like Tehran has played their piece, knowingly or not, extraordinarily well. Of course, there's a lot more history and context to the many, many wars fought between Israel and Hamas that eventually led up to the current war that's ongoing today. The current conflict is actually the fifth war that they have fought between each other, with previous large-scale wars being waged between them in 2021, in 2014, in 2009, and in 2008, and skirmishes and attacks between them being fought all in between that have all contributed even further to the buildup of total war that began in October of 2023. But unfortunately, due to the inherently violent, controversial, and recent nature of discussing how an organization like Hamas was able to catapult itself into power in the Middle East, and how all of the many wars between them and the Israelis have gone ever since, the next part of this video would almost certainly cause the rest of the video that came before it to become demonetized and age-restricted, which ultimately would mean that YouTube's algorithm would have never promoted any of this video to you, and you would probably never have gotten to see any of it. But thankfully, I was still able to produce that next part of this video anyway because of the power of Nebula, where you can go and watch the next full-length part covering exactly how Hamas managed to rise to power in Gaza and how the many wars and conflicts between them and the Israelis have been fought ever since. If you want a broader context behind this conflict with information that this video didn't quite get into, like what the Gaza Strip really is, what Hamas is, and how the conflict between Gaza, Hamas, and Israel has constantly evolved over decades into its current form, then this is what you should check out next, as it's all very important to understand if you want to try and make sense of what's going on here right now. And this is also just one of more than two dozen exclusive full-length real-life lore videos that you can only find on Nebula in my overall Modern Conflict series there that can all only be found over there because of all of their darker, more controversial subject material. 
There are dozens of other episodes covering how other recent major wars and conflicts in the Middle East began and went that this video also never really dived into, like the rise and fall of ISIS across Iraq and Syria, the modern civil wars in Syria, Yemen, and Libya, a deeper dive into the origins of the United States-Iran conflict, the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, and the 20-year-long American invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, along with dozens of others and brand new episodes releasing every single month that will help keep you up to date and informed with all of the proper context that you need to understand major ongoing crises and conflicts. And what's even more, you also get access to all of the other amazing exclusive content that's on Nebula. Because the best part about this site is that it's jointly co-owned by all of its creators, built by me and hundreds of other YouTubers and podcasters. And because it's a subscription-based service, we all get to work on way bigger and higher budget productions over there than we ever could do on YouTube. That's why there's tons of other exclusive content that you'll find equally fascinating from tons of other creators that you probably already know as well, like Wendover Productions, Neo, Polymatter, and so many more. Last year across 2022, tens of thousands of you signed up for Nebula through my links on this channel using the Curiosity Stream and Nebula bundle deal that gave you a big discount and access to both sites. But now that it's been an entire year and it's nearly 2024, that deal is expiring. If you want to retain your access to Nebula in order to keep watching all of my Modern Conflict series with new episodes every month and all the other awesome exclusive ad-free content, there's a link down below in my description that'll give you a 40% discount to switch your plan over to Nebula directly, so it'll only end up costing you two and a half dollars a month. A part of that subscription goes directly back to me and my team to continue funding our journalism here to help us make even more videos like the one you just watched, and the ones that you can go and watch on Nebula next. So if you're interested in watching a bunch of cool, exclusive, ad-free stuff from dozens of creators on Nebula and supporting real-life lore, make sure to use that link in the description or click this button that's here on your screen right now. I'm a firm believer in good, independent journalism and tons of independent creators banding together to build something like this. So I will see some of you over on Nebula next, and as always, thank you so much for watching.